exactly two o'clock, so if we can begin, can I take the opportunity to welcome you all to today's main travel committee, obviously our budget meeting in which we will agree a budget to recommend to the combined authority. We can start by calling for any apologies for absence. Councillor Hayhoe, Councillor Keith Roberts and Councillor Ned Roberts. <coughs> okay, just a cursory glance around the chambers helping our answers here. Um, the second item is declarations of interest and that's just the usual for me to remind anyone if they have anything um, to declare at this point or if anything uh, comes up during the debate please make sure the defendant notifies accordingly and we can make sure the declarations will be sorted out um, in line with procedures. Third item is the minutes of the last meeting and if I can move that the minutes of the meeting held on the 7th of January if those are approved as a correct record if that's agreed. Just before we, we go forward, if I can just remind everyone so to use their microphones uh, and speak into them accordingly to make sure everyone can hear, hear the debate. Um, the fourth item is the minutes of the General Purposes Subcommittee, and if I can move the proceedings of that committee held on the 14th of January, if that's agreed. Excellent. Item number five, John. Thanks, Chair. So I'd like to move the minutes of the performance and use of the subcommittee on the 1st of February. Thank you. Is that agreed? Excellent, thank you. Okay, uh, moving on then. Item number six is the Mersey Tunnel Tolls for 2016-17. And Gary Evans is going to present this report for us. Thank you, Chair. Members will be aware that the combined authority actually set the tunnel tolls for me to its meeting tomorrow on the 5th of February. Uh, but requires in advance of that that the Mercy Travel Committee uh, consider detailed options around the tolls and make recommendations to the combined authorities as part of that toll setting process. So this report in, in effect sets out those options and makes those recommendations for members to consider today. Uh, I, I, keep, I won't go through the details of, of the report for people to, to have the ability to read in advance. See some of the key recommendations in there include <coughs> no increase on the cash toll for the third year running, so to retain cash tolls at their current levels. Uh, there would, uh, the proposal, the recommendation is that the fast tag would reduce by 20 pence for class one and for similar amounts of multiples thereof of classes two, three, and four. So, as an example, for those there's discounts in there for current fast tag users and also wider discounts available for those that want to take up the offer of a fast tag opportunity and account moving forward. In, in determining that consideration has been and the review from the total tolls review process set up by the combined authority has been taken account of and, and built into those recommendations. One of the rationales around increasing the fast tag, the discount for fast tag is in effect it's our, our best option for targeting local users and attached to the report as appendix B just shows a heat map around the volume of fast tag account holders and where they set where the percent where they sent it went across the city region. So it's an opportunity to offer discounts to those local users. But also a recognition that, that for those fast tag account holders who live outside of the city region, many of those still typically work shopping in the region, so it's really important that we retain that, and that discount method really is about rewarding most frequent users of, of the tunnels. Uh, the other benefits, there are several other benefits around uh, discount for fast tag users, most significant in our operational factors, and the less reliance on cash brings greater efficiency through the toll plaza, and therefore helps speed the journey up for the local users as well. So there's a range of benefits. The report also brings or recommends a number of other discounts to be brought in in 2016-17. In One of those is about amending our policy for our emergency service vehicles and all. The, the recommendation is that all livery emergency service vehicles will be allowed toll-free through the tunnels. And that builds on the existing concession where it's, it's those travelling on the blue light that will be extended to all vehicles whatever the reason. And also the recommendation in there is a further change is that the, the tunnels will be free for users from 10 p.m. on Christmas Eve to 6 a.m. on Boxing Day, just in recognition of that there's limited public transport options during that same period. 
say this, don't we? It's that time of year again. Uh, and we are the organisation that has been uh, given the responsibility for maintaining two of the major routes that drive and uh, support economic growth um, within the Liverpool city region. Um, and we've asked in the past, does anyone else want to take on that responsibility? Governments of, of various natures, most typically the last government said quite fairly no. So, so the, the tunnels are our responsibility and it's our, our duty to maintain them, as uh, Gary says, as free flowing uh, and keep them maintained and updated. They are huge pieces of engineering kit in their own right, which take massive investments. We've also seen improvements in safety and security of the tunnels with its own sort of mini police force operating. So it is uh, an awesome task, simply keeping traffic flowing between uh, the, the two sides of, of, of the region. So that's our first and foremost duty, and, that, and I think we've done that in an exemplary fashion and done it really, really well as, as, a, as an organisation. We should all take credit for that. But it is actually seen by people as, you know, a local tax on, on movement, on, on, on the free uh, movements of trade, etc. Um, and that's historic, uh, and the tunnels are and will be with us for, for a long, long time. So, uh, in the light of the re initial review of this uh, combined authority and, uh, and the direction of travel, and that's all, all it, is at the, it is at the moment, uh, we have been able to, through our own good financing here and the efficient operation of the tunnels, we've been able to have some wriggle room, some maneuverability within the toll setting. And I think we've done that to good effect. And the reason we've done that to good effect is that the third year, the, the cash toll, uh, which is still the most popular, strangely, uh, has been frozen. So effectively, uh, by any, any other measure, if government use this measure, if you, you don't increase something over three years, that's an effectively uh, a cut over three years uh, as inflation moves on. And the other thing is that um, we've now been able to actually make a direct deduction although there was always an advantage in having a fast tag, that advantage now is massive. It's a massive advantage to have a fast tag. And you see by the, the heat map, uh, it shows that it will be, you know, as a, as a will representative, particularly welcome on the will side, but further afield within the city region. So I have to say, if you are a regular user of the tunnel and you haven't got a fast tag, you must be star grave and bonkers, frankly, uh, to, call, to call it a phrase. You must actually try and invest in that because you will be saving yourself money uh, and, and, and making it the journey better. But I do sort of want to make some, uh, it's not really my style to make many, many political points, but I have to say this is in stark contrast to opinions that were being given by certain politicians, notably uh, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, George Osborne, who was promising all sorts just immediately before a key marginal election result was announced. And where has he been since then? Well, he's gone either gone into hiding or has gone quiet on the issue, as so as any other government department. There is not one penny, not one single penny of government money that is helping us out of this, despite demands over the tunnel debt, despite demands through the devolution deal to actually have some direct help, not a penny of central government, despite promises, has gone here. So we are, if you like, we are the organisation that's out there, and I'm going to use my phrase, and it might sound corny, but I would say to the Chancellor of the Exchequer, the tunnels on Merseyside are for life, not just for election time. And that's quite clearly, we've been given the duty to look after them. I think we've managed that in a gently fashion over the years. I've not always agreed with the decisions of this body, they're on record, but I think this is a great movement in, in the right direction. And it is part of the integrated transport network that, that we have. And we will continue to look and review. And I particularly welcome uh, the anomaly of the uh, emergency services and the delivery, delivery vehicles being allowed free access. That must be a massive saving across the whole of the region to all our, our uh, emergency services. I really welcome that. But I think it really is uh, a, a great moment. And we should, as an organisation, because we often take the flat when we don't seem to all harm it, be it to get it right. We should take absolute full credit and with the work, working hand in hand with the combined authority, take major credit on behalf of the city region for delivering. And we have delivered, we've delivered safe, well maintained tunnels, and now we're actually physically reducing the cost of that crossing. And I think it's all credit to you. I'm 
treat the UK uh, uh, as, as leader of this political leader's organisation, you should take some personal credit too, so thank you. Thanks, Steve. Ken? Thanks, Joe. I welcome this report also. I remember a number of years ago in the Daily Post headline, it was like a wanted poster, poster. these people have put your souls up. Uh, I wonder if this recommendation, when this recommendation is going through, well, we have to say in headlines, these people have put your tunnels down. Uh, congratulate us on doing that, because this is what we've done for the people of Merseyside. Uh, and, you know, we have wonderful tunnels, they are the star attraction throughout the world, uh, well maintained, the safest in the world, uh, and, you know, not only have we managed to put them down, but we're making them more attractive for more and more people. Uh, I think, you know, all should be congratulated on doing this, Chair, and I think we should happily uh, welcome our little colleagues who have verbally opposed this proposal because of it affects them over the, over the water more than anything else. Hopefully, now they're on board, uh, we can all go and uh, join, join up together. So I welcome the proposal, Chair. Okay, thank you, Chair. saying that, um, first of all, I'd echo Steve's comments. Yeah, this is something that we try to do by local initiative. It's what we work in hand in hand with combined authority looked at, how we can improve the deal for local people. And let me be very, very clear when I say that the Conservative government have not given us any support or assistance in this whatsoever. This is things that we're trying to do at a local level to make things better for our residents and our businesses. And that's why I'm particularly pleased that today we're able to bring forward a recommendation to reduce the cost of fast tax. It's something we've always been keen to do by making sure that kind of the most regular uh, local residents and businesses <coughs> get the opportunity to use the fast tax and get a discount. To give them an even bigger discount is a great thing to do to look after those key people uh, travelling across the city region. But it's not just about how we reduce the cost of the fast tag, it's getting more people to take up the fast tag. So one of the recommendations within the report is looking at how we can rebrand and remarket the fast tag to make sure we can get a majority of local residents and local businesses using it so that they can get an even better deal on the cost of traveling in the river. And I think that's really what it boils down to at the end of the day. One of the key focuses of this organization is affordability. Making sure that we can deliver the best possible service at the best possible price for people travelling around our city region. What we're doing on tunnels today is a demonstration of how we want to move that in the right direction. What we've been doing on Mersey Rail for over a decade now has been sort of demonstrated in the latest national passenger scores of how Mersey Rail is recognised as the number one train operation in the country. One of the key reasons is because its fares are much more affordable 
than train fares you would find in other parts of the country. And I'll really kind of underline that point now in the sense that there's one glaring anomaly on the transport network in, tone, in terms of affordability here in the Liverpool city region, and that is that of bus fares. The bus fares that are charged at this moment in time make no sense and frankly are far too expensive. So I'm calling on the fact that we're doing our bit with tunnel tolls and rail fares. I'm calling on bus companies now to recognise that point and cut their fares. With all of that in mind, if I can commend this report uh, to the committee and if I can move uh, the recommendations in paragraph two of the report, if that's agreed. Excellent. Item number seven is the budget, and we've got John who's uh, to present this for us. Uh, thank you, Chair. This report includes the budget for 2016-17 and the capital programme. Also provides an update on where we are this year um, in terms of our outturn or likely outturn, because that obviously influences how much resources we have available for next year. It also includes as an appendix. Merseyside corporate plan for next year. And this is important because it demonstrates how the budget and the plan have been integrated and that is a clear demonstration of how our resources are prioritised. Each year this process is becoming more comprehensive because meeting our savings targets becomes increasingly difficult. Obviously we wouldn't have the low hanging fruits may be high us. Budget holders and heads of service have worked really um, hard with colleagues in both finance and, and policy over pretty much most of this year and again on behalf of the directors of, of Mercy Travel I want to recognise this effort and thank those that are involved. It's been a real team effort this year. Clearly that also includes yourselves as members and consulted as part of this process. We've had discussions with members to, to ensure that the members' priorities are reflected in both the budget and clearly the corporate plan. Across the organisation there's been a responsible approach to this process and as a result we continue to drive costs out of the organisation by improving our efficiency, making better decisions on commissioning, through better procurement and contract managing and through better use of our assets. And as a result, next year's budget will once again allow the CA to reduce the transport levy very significantly. Before I come to that, it's worth reminding members though of the relationship between the CA and Mersey Travel and what recommendations really mean. Mersey Travel, as an organisation, is the transport delivery arm, delivery arm of the CA outside Bolton, but things are slightly different. It is a separate statutory body with directors, and we as directors are responsible to the CA, and it's the CA where our funding is derived from. The Mersey Travel Committee acts on behalf of the CA in holding Mersey Travel as directors to account. Part of that process is to make recommendations to the CA on the level of resources Mersey Travel needs to fulfil its responsibilities and to manage its risks in a given year. So Mersey Travel Committee will make a recommendation to the CA tomorrow based on the consideration of value for money and affordability. We also need to uh, be assured and provide that assurance that Mersey Travel has sufficient resources to manage its risks and to meet its priorities next year. For next year, we're recommending that Mersey Travel requires funding for the CA, from the CA, of 94.4 million for its non-tunnels activities. This represents a reduction of 3 million from last year's original budget. To find that 3 million reduction has actually meant 7 million pounds worth of savings that needed to be identified. Clearly because, you know, as an organisation we also subject to inflation, unavoidable um, contractual increases in costs and, and growth because of the involved in demand in some areas and in you know, slightly changed responsibilities primarily um, around the CA. So many of that £7 million savings have already been reflected in the current year's budget. You'll see that in the underspend that we're forecasting, um, particularly around concession and travel, the Northern Rail Direct Award, changes to revenue protection and survey staff rising from ticket changes, smart ticketing. That's already been reflected in the budget. Other savings are new for next year and there's around two and a half million pounds worth of savings. We've had two point eight million of additional savings that we've worked to try and identify for next year. Lots of that is around um, smaller but very significant 
savings um, that are actually quite significant for the service itself around better, uh, better asset management, uh, and I mean asset management from a small way and a small way, management of the assets rather than the, the section asset management, um, around pubs and our other premises, increased income from FERS, which is a decision that, that's already been taken, um, increased income from National Express and also So the outcome of all these efforts is that Mersey Travels should be able to recommend to the CA that the transport levy, levy can be reduced by another 8.3 million next year to just over 105 million. Bear in mind, it was 20, it was, it's not too long ago, it was only last year, but it was 127 million. So that's a 22 million pound reduction uh, over two years, 17.5%. It, it, it's highly significant. It will make a significant impact on Mersey travel and we've, we've strove where possible to avoid that hitting policies or customers and frontline services. But it's also going to make a significant impact on the budget setting process of each of the districts because we are always mindful of the financial situation of districts and we have to be responsible in, in, in setting a budget that's affordable. We work very closely with leaders, chief execs, treasurers and the transport leads of districts to make sure that set a budget that recognises the needs of transport but also balances it with non-transport. Um, as well as the levy, we also receive special rail grant, primarily from those of rail electrics. That's yet to be confirmed and the indication should be to DFT is it will be subject to reduction. We've put our best estimate within the budget, but what we will do with Mersey Rail, MEL are aware of this, we will work with Mersey Rail to make sure that if and when it does go down, the taxpayer, Mersey Travel, will not be disadvantaged. A lot of the special rail grant is actually passed through to network railing charges, so even if special rail grant goes down, the net figure will stay the same and won't have an impact, hopefully. We also take a great deal of comfort from the devolution deal, and that should limit any reductions in SRG to what is a manageable level, and we've, uh, we've secured that DFT in return for our local investment in rolling stock the role in stock replacement is one of our key activities and priorities for next year. Obviously, a big year um, for that. The third source of revenue we get is the grant we get from the CA for operating the tunnels and managing the tunnels assets on the CA behalf. It comes from tolls, as you just heard the toll report. Um, the tolls themselves are no longer our direct income, but they do pay for the operating grant that we receive. The grant will receive same at 27 million, allow us to progress major schemes such as the rewiring that's currently ongoing and the modernisation of the tolling system, which again will require a separate decision. We've made a provision for that in next year's budget, as well as effectively maintaining a safe environment for tunnel users and the tunnels staff alike. The overall capital programme will be 31.3 million next year, but we will be relying less on direct levy contributions more on other sources of financing, primarily local growth fund, but also use of our accumulated reserve position. And those reserves have been accumulated for the financing capital. It's only right that we should use 
use them for those purposes uh, at a prudential and appropriate level and sustainable in the long term as well. As well as the tunnel schemes, you'll see uh, the programme of non-tunnel schemes would include a county bus station and LGF funded rail schemes around Newley Willows, McGull and Honton Curve being, being the greater of those. All part of the uh, devolution and, and the growth deal. At the same time as that, again, is that we've reviewed, we've, we've reviewed the plan and produced five key priorities that we'll use next year to guide uh, our activities, guide the prioritisation of resources. We now read them out verbatim, they relate, they relate to connectivity, management of our assets and services, that includes provision of rolling and stock on the around network, the delivery of a city region comprehensive bus strategy, promotion of affordable and sustainable travel, and clearly supporting the CA directly as its accountable body and, in and also directly as its transport executive and provider of strategic transport advice. The budget will allow us to deliver those priorities, but it doesn't mean that all our resources are diverted into those areas. Clearly the risk register is also integral and just as important as the corporate plan to make sure that the budget is, as ever, managing our services in a safe and efficient manner. So before referring Thank you. 
mentioned, the CA should acknowledge that it's no longer, it's, it's too big a beast for Mersey Travel to continue to support. But we'll continue to support it, we'll continue to support through, you know, our base budget. Yeah, thanks for that, John. I think Tony raised a very good, good point, but I think it's, it's more primarily for the combined authority there, push me to tomorrow and how they sort of uh, develop their wider kind of uh, strategic role over the years. Is there any further questions or comments that anyone wants to add before I just sum up and, and reiterate some of the bits that have been said? First of all, on a presentational point, um, I just really want to commend the offices on producing a really readable and accessible budget that actually doesn't just make life easier for us as members and politicians, more importantly, it makes it open, accountable and transparent to the people who we're ultimately accountable to, and that's the 1.4 million people who call the Pool City Region home. So, really want to commend offices on how they pulled something together which actually for the person in the street uh, is dead um, straightforward uh, to go through. Also as well it's great how um, appended to the budget we also have the draft corporate plan. I think that shows how as an organisation we're developing in a really professional manner of making sure that our budget reflects our corporate plan and our corporate objectives reflect our budget. It's a really kind of uh, strong way that we've been working for a number of years now and continuing to strengthen. I think it's, it's also really important to mention about how we are continuing to reduce our levy and that at the end of the day is really all about how not only we cut our clock accordingly to make sure we provide the most efficient service for what we do but more importantly that we're able to give money back to the districts of the city region that help them with some of the swinging financial challenges that they find themselves in again because of a Conservative government. Um, I also think it's important to highlight the, the points that Steve made as well, that whilst we're having to reduce what we spend, we're still being really innovative, innovative in what we do. We should never lose sight of the fact, for example, in the last financial year, we have delivered the best deal for young people on the transport network anywhere in the country outside of London. We've been able to do that because it's the right thing to do, but still do it with a uh, reducing budget. And where we have had to make reductions, we have done that in a really, really sensitive way. I want to pay tribute to all the League members for the way that they've done that in their service area, that whilst it does mean we spend less, actually the impact to people using the transport network is really kind of managed and doesn't sort of um, disenfranchise people from how they can travel around the city region. So, with all of that in mind, if I can move the recommendations of paragraph two if that's agreed. Excellent. Item 8 is the response to the consultation on national planning policy changes. Sue Downs, there. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll keep it fairly brief. Effectively, what you have before you are the government's response to the government's proposed changes to the national planning policy framework, which was published in March 2012. Changes are very wide scale, but they are directly related to proposals around affordable housing and supporting the delivery of start homes. Obviously these are key areas that are far more applicable to the planning authority, but we've always taken the opportunity whenever government are consulting on changes to the planning policy to remind them that transport considerations should always be built into planning considerations and that the two aren't mutually exclusive. We've set out in paragraph four an idea of the key areas that we felt were most um, relevant to MERS travel and therefore we wanted to try and find an appropriate outlet within, the, within our response to various questions to include these points to be made. The main point, obviously, that we're trying to make within there is the role that transport plays in underpinning economic growth and really pinning home the, the point that a cohesive community is a connected community. We can't go ahead and sort of build a new community without building in transport considerations and making sure that the people who live there can get in and out effectively. So it is a fairly, fairly short response um, within Appendix 1, and as I say, there are a lot of questions within there that aren't really relevant to Mersey Travel, so we have just responded to the four questions within there, the response has <coughs> Appendix 1. Thank you, Any questions or comments? Just John? Thanks, Joe. It's just with, thanks very much, Suzanne, for your action report. Um, it's just with direct reference to 1.1c, really, supporting sustainable new development development ground for the land with small sites and the big amount of development land. And then that relates to comment 1.2. I just have a concern, really, that if we are actually talking about intensification by the commercial and residential properties in those areas, that A, it will lead to an increase in sort of environmental issues, and secondly, whether it be an issue in terms of actually being able for us to actually be able to deliver the transport infrastructure within those areas as well. Because I noticed within the appendix that that's one of the comments that you actually made. So some comments on that would be 
Yeah, as, as you sort of said, it, it is because so much of it was geared around sort of definitions of affordable housing, definition of starter homes, that then it did start to sort of stray into the fact that um, it was about sort of freeing up land that had already identified as, as a suitable for a transport hub and such like. So within the response, we did try to sort of really hammer, hammer down the fact that if, if we've sort of got things highlighted for transport hubs, if we've got things identified as a park and ride facility, expanding park and ride or expanding sort of transport development shouldn't be sort of put as secondary to, to planning and, and housing developments. But again, reinforcing that point that you have to look at them side by side and you have to ensure that when you're building a building or transport or a housing development, that you do sort of put those transport considerations in there. And if land is suitable for a transport purpose, then it is retained as such and not to sacrifice purely for the building of housing. No further questions or comments, I just want to say that it's straightforward and a really good response to on, so thanks for that. And if I can move the recommendations in paragraph two of the report, that's agreed. Excellent. There's no um, urgent uh, AOB, so in that case, if I can close the meeting, I look forward to seeing you at the next committee.